Hello everyone to another episode of Nerd RX podcast and I'm your host Barkha. Today we are going to talk about MST that is micro skill thermophoresis and to talk about that we have a very good friend of mine Connor O'Hara. Welcome Connor to the show. Thank you Barkha, pleasure to be here. So before we get into what MST is, uh Connor, why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners? Sure. Um my name is Connor O'Hara. I am a doctoral candidate in the School of Pharmacy Department of Medicinal Chemistry at Virginia Commonwealth University. I'm a fifth year graduate student who's earned a master's in pharmaceutical sciences and will hope to defend my doctorate next year. Um in the same, I work in the lab of Dr. Umesh Desai, who does anticoagulants, um you know, protease and enzyme inhibitors, um, as well as he delves into cancer, which is my project. And so um, prior to coming to graduate school, I worked at a contract research organization called Pharmaceutical Product Development. Um, I was in the immunochemistry department there, performed many different um, ELISA, electrochemical luminescent assays. Um, you know, I, I came there from an internship at Virginia Tech where I received my bachelor's of science going in reverse order here, but, uh, that's quite all right. <laughs> and, um, I decided that I needed a graduate degree. So I, I asked questions from uh, mentors and other figures and they influenced me to return to graduate school so that I could uh, be a more uh, sophisticated scientist and an independent thinker. And, and then my hopes, uh, will be to graduate, defend my dissertation next year and return to an industry position. Well, good luck with that. Thank you. It's been a long journey for you. <laughs> yes. Yes, it has. <laughs> uh so, uh let's talk about MST. Uh what is MST and what about it got you interested and just tell us why did you pick this particular technique? Sure. Um so as you had mentioned, MST is an acronym. It stands for micro scale thermophoresis because who wants to say that um a bunch of times but in the name itself yep. you know we we get a few things micro uh micro scale um and then thermophoresis which is pretty key to to how this technique works so what is it it's a biophysical technique for you to study um biomolecular interactions um between many different species um and it requires very low volume to use um it's dependent upon a number of factors that would be influenced upon a molecule binding to a protein or a protein engaging with another protein etc that can be tracked um via fluorescence and help us determine uh quantitative parameters for binding such as binding affinities um kinetics of the binding event uh, stoichiometry etc a number of things we have in the department of medicinal chemistry a shared resource room that uh has a bunch of different uh, instruments inside that facilitate moderate and high throughput screening um to determine things like this and uh we had purchased a uh, microscale thermophoretic instrument from Nanotemper um which is a leading company doing this some years ago in our lab because um my PI had actually spent a good deal of our department money to purchase this was tasked with being the lead um on its care its use um and and maintenance for it. So I've been using this instrument for, you know, the past couple of years um on and off between other biophysical methods to try and characterize the activity of some cool molecules we have in the realm of, you know, anti-cancer field and and determine uh, parameters that you know I before mentioned uh, for these molecules. So we have a decent amount of experience in our lab and you know, I was trained by a postdoc a couple years ago to use it. and and have been using it since with uh, various degrees of success. <laughs> That's awesome. Why is uh MST important and uh I'm pretty sure uh, before MST came into picture there might have been other alternative techniques. Um uh, Correct. Um uh, So can we can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So microscale thermophoresis um is unique in that it is um a mobilization free um that is one of the main advantages of of MST um 
other techniques that have been here, uh, you know, before. So require the like, uh, for example, a normal ELISA assay or, um, for example, surface plasmon resonance um, in, its, in its various forms require you to take the or molecule of interest, such as a protein, and immobilize it somehow uh, to a surface such that you can then evaluate changes to the engagement of that surface with a small molecule. Or on the contrary, um, you can take a, a ligand, a small molecule, and immobilize it to the surface of a slide or a sensor, and then evaluate the changes of interaction of a free-floating protein. Um, the problem with this, um, the concept of a mobilization free is that under native conditions in our body, um, although those systems are much more complex, things are allowed to freely move and maneuver. And this will um, you know, be able to have a, a native, unique engagement. But if we are to immobilize one partner or the other, in any of these binding evaluations, we remove that freedom um, of movement and rotation and, and thus influence how that engagement might actually be happening. So that is uh, one of the major advantages of microscale thermophoresis um, in, a, in addition to a, a handful of other things such as the amount of volume that is used, um, the, the ability, you know, because this uses fluorescence to um, manipulate the labeling of molecules with, with various um, extrinsic fluorophores. So this is something that a handful of companies have, um, I don't want to say monopolized on, but have taken advantage of, and they are the, the major players in the field for uh, services rendered on an MST level. Right. So uh, like you mentioned, uh, this is relatively a newer technique, I would say, and not many departments have access to MST. Correct. This is this is true. Um, you know, it's only in the last handful of, you know, two decades or more that this technique has come to prevalence in uh, commercial markets for use in small academic labs. You know, largely there's a, a huge development for any new biophysical method. And oftentimes when they come out, they're incredibly expensive such that um, only people in industry, um, large corporations can make these purchases. So um, we've gone through several decades now of optimization of not only um, spectra photometers and another kind of you know, old school devices for, for evaluating uh, changes in signals um, to something that is, is benchtop, something that is uh, cheaper um, despite is still high cost on, on academia to to put inside your lab. And there's been a growing number of institutions and departments that have incorporated MST um, into a room similar to ours, where there's a bunch of biophysical um, equipment and apparatus to determine you know, these kinds of measurements. So for us in the Department of Medicinal Chemistry, there's essentially only this device on campus and we have students from the chemistry department, from the School of Medicine, from all over um, that have to sign up and reserve time to, to use it because it you know, is an expensive purchase for us to have. And we're the only ones that, that essentially have it, which provides a great resource for students within our department who are interested in getting data about those kinds of measurements. So you mean entire VCU has just one MST? Yes. Um, this, is, oh, wow. this is a very... Um, competitive, you know, use, but often under marketed and represented uh, such that I think there's a lot of students here at, at VCU that aren't aware that we have this instrument and, and that perhaps is the better for students that use this regularly. <laughs> but um, right. Right. the instrument has a, a variety of consumables that are used, which are PI dependent for, for purchase, essentially. So um, things like the, the capillaries and the labeling kits those are, are consumables, and and what a, a company would do is if they know you're reliant upon these consumables to use the instrument, then that itself becomes a little bit expensive. Um, so yeah. we have to reserve time to use it, and then you have to supply your own consumables essentially to use the instrument. Yeah, that is the issue with, I think, major of these type of techniques where only 
there are only certain number of companies or just one company that is manufacturing this so they have like you said monopoly even on the consumables too and there is you have to purchase them there. there is no other way right out of it so when was this purchase i don't remember uh, me being at vcu ms i didn't hear about that no so we we had um you know doc, one of our other faculty dr may you're aware of had yeah um coordinated with dr desai and, and dr safo others within our department to secure it I want to say within the last six, seven years. So when you were here, this was uh, still a relatively new purchase. And this was something that, okay. you know, it's on this side of the building. It's on one side of our wing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> you were kind of on the tail end of your dissertation, getting ready to depart when you know, we, we had yeah. had this. And, and from your lab, I've never seen anyone come in and use it. So this is, uh, you know, could be marketed better. Yeah, we were, I think, more chemistry heavy, right? And small molecules. And you have all these radio ligand binding assays, you know, that you use to evaluate the same measurements that we're recording. So I think uh, you get comfortable with techniques, and whatever is working for you, you continue to use it. Yeah. It's only when hey, there's a problem, yeah. this system it doesn't work that you start exploring alternatives. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure at the end of my dissertation, all I wanted to do is just get over with it right. and not look around what's happening in the other labs. Right. And, oh it's, my God. It's, it's best, it's best to, uh, ignorance is bliss sometimes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, my next thing I would like to know is how, uh, like what are the steps involved? How long does it take for you? For example, if you are running an experiment on MSD, so how do you begin and how do you end? How long does the entire process take? Sure. So if you have, um, say, say you're trying to evaluate the engagement of a small molecule to a protein and you have stock solutions of both the small molecule and the protein, um, the, the entire process can take, you know, an hour and a half or less. There are several okay. stages to doing the titration or the experiment titering in your small molecule to uh, the protein. The first, um, you have to determine how your protein is going to be fluorescently labeled. So the entire instrument, the use of it is based on fluorescence. There is uh, a number of consumables from companies where you can have um, amine labeled or cysteine labeled or NTA, his, you know, uh, fluorescent uh, dyes that you can then uh, tag your protein in to uh, produce the signal that's necessary for the experiment. And this is often a, uh, a precursor step in, in any experiment for this is, do we need the histag protein or do we just have the, the native protein? And if so, which kind of a fluorescent tag are we going to purchase? What kind of labeling kit are we going to purchase um, to, to then do these kinds of experiments? So the first step is determining then um, what is the affinity of whatever fluorescent label your dye, what is the affinity of that to the protein? That is the initial step of any kind of MST experiment such that you can, unless of course you're doing an intrinsic experiment that is label free, but most people use um, extrinsic fluorophores uh, because of the sensitivity of them. So in, in these kinds of experiments, first thing you want to determine is what is the affinity of the protein to the dye? And it can be the, um, the company we use has a set cutoff point where it's greater than X or it's less than X. And that ultimately will dictate the changes in how much dye or how much protein you are, you are adding in your mixture um, to produce a signal that is, is stable um, and is, is sensitive to carry out the experiment. So this is step one. How well does the protein dye, uh, bind to the dye? If it is a tight affinity, um, you proceed then to what you would say is a, a, you know, the actual experiment, the titration, where you will have in um, you know, a serial dilution scheme that you're working out in a micro titer plate. Um, most people use 384 wells because of the small volumes, right? Micro scale, we're using volumes of, of protein that are, you know, 10 microliters um, of, of a, a low nanomolar concentration. Um, you don't need 
micromolar or millimolar amounts of protein, and you only need um, 10 microliters of it to do these experiments. And so then you will incubate whatever amount of protein you've determined is important with the dye. You leave it in the dark for 30 minutes. You have to remove then after that period of time excess dye because um, maybe the affinity is really tight and you saturate really quickly and you have a bunch of free floating dyes still hanging around um, in your tube, your microcentrifuge tube that you don't want to then you know, expose to your experiment. So you have to centrifuge it. Um, you remove the uh, supernatant, um, the excess dye. Um, you know, you don't want to be in your solution anymore. And so you remove a supernatant and then you can begin your experiment where you are mixing the protein um, with predetermined uh, aliquots of buffer. Uh, simple PBS is usually fine or um, you know, other PBS-like buffers are fine. You ins yeah, and then you're doing a zero dilution scheme where you're, you're adding different concentrations of your ligand across a continuous concentration of protein. So protein remains constant, but as you do your twofold or threefold or however serial dilution of your, um, your ligand, you know, that across the plate is, is, is what changes. So you do this first and then you add the equivalent amount of protein. It's a one-to-one -one mixture usually for a lot of people in the experiment. From this, mm -hmm. you can then um, essentially begin the experiment. You take capillaries. So these little thin, you know, glass capillaries, they make, uh, you know, different kinds depending upon um, how sensitive the environment needs to be or whether you feel that the protein or ligand may absorb and stick to the, the capillaries themselves. And right. you take these and you simply, um, the company we use has a little uh, ledge where you can put your plate and it holds the plate um, at an angle. And then you take your capillaries, stick your capillaries inside of the wells. Um, you know, capillary action sucks up what the contents of the wells are into yeah. the into the uh, capillaries, and you place it in the instrument. Um, most instruments have several um, kind of sections for multiple capillaries to be run at the same time, so that you could be evaluating multiple engagements at the same time. And then from this, you set uh, you know your software. You you put into the software. This is the starting concentration of protein that I have, and it's constant in all the wells. This is the starting concentration of ligand, and I have a serial dilution like this, where it'll automatically fill out all those concentrations for you. You set whether you are using uh, high excitation um, or low excitation for the infrared laser that's being used, and you know other smaller parameters are set up, um, and then it's a it's a click and watch. Um, you literally you know click start. The instrument then takes um, an infrared laser, and depending upon which dye you choose, the excitation power will, you know, be be different. Um, you know, six six hundred to seven hundred nanometer um, range is, is typically uh, used for you know red dyes, and then you know we get we get blue dyes. Um, the excitation is is obviously much lower, uh, but the instrument will then shoot infrared laser at each capillary. Okay and determine if there is any change in fluorescent intensity. Typically, when we increase, um, so this is, is doing a, a very small temperature gradient, right? If you were to say, okay, we're gonna shoot a laser at a capillary and there's a one or two degree Kelvin change, um, that's you know fairly significant. And then the particles and how they respond to that movement is, it's a temperature related intensity change of the fluorophore. Um, most of the time, when you increase the temperature of a fluorophore, the um, fluorescent intensity of that fluorophore will decrease. And so MST in a nutshell is using two different um, you know, pieces of information to determine the overall signal. The first being, how does the intensity of the fluorophore change when I hit it with this infrared laser? And then the second, which is part of the word MST, is thermophoresis or the movement of the particles. So the instrument is first shooting the laser, determining if there's any changes in intensity of the fluorophore. And then the instrument is evaluating based on the movement of those fluorescently labeled you know, protein monomers, uh, how far they are moving. And the movement of those particles will entirely be dictated on um, the size of the particle, its charge, um, 
the hydration shell, you know, the water that's sitting around it, as well as how that environment changes when your small molecule binds to and engages with it. Um, it's, it's ability to move and migrate and, and the changes in, in the, uh, the environment of that, that binding engagement. That is the thermophoretic change, is tracking the movement of that particle based on the heat driving uh, the molecules away and how the binding of a small molecule might impact that movement. Um, so then both of these things, the temper, uh, temperature related induced change uh, of fluorescence and then the thermophoresis of these particles, the software um, generally innately is, is combining what it's observing here, determining photo bleaching, aggregation um, and other things to then produce a plot of bound and unbound based on those changes. Mm -hmm. And then obviously you can use okay. nonlinear regression analysis and determine, um, you know, a concept like binding affinity, um, a KD at 50%. Yeah. So it, it can take usually no more than an hour and a half. Um, determining the affinity of the dye to the protein is usually a precursor experiment. Um, other control experiments mm -hmm. you can do too. One might do that first, examine the data, and say, okay, it's good, and then proceed to another experiment, both taking no more than 45 minutes each. That's pretty quick. Yeah, it is. It's very quick. Um, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the labeling and the, you know, the uh, centrifugation and things like that that add time, but the actual experiment itself is maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then you have another half hour or so okay. of, of additional steps, uh, provided that you have all of your reagents um, on, on hand ready to go. Okay. And once you have your, you have run this experiment and you get your data, is the analysis difficult or it's pretty straightforward? It's, it's pretty straightforward, right? Um, in any biophysical analysis, if you were to give me data points and ask me to fit it, you know, I, we'd, you'd be able to fit it, right? Um, Nonlinear regression analysis, yep. the shape of the curve, whether it's sigmoidal or hyperbolic, um, all of these things are just numbers, they're data points. But for people who are not um, accustomed to using um, some of the, the typical um, data analysis softwares that are available at most universities, the, there are a lot of built-in features to most of these um, MST devices that will automatically calculate these things for you and kind of give you raw right. raw PDF data files of what was observed in, in the experiment. And these data files will contain um, you know, a variety of pieces of information, such as whether there's aggregation, um, you know, the shape of the capillary scans, the, uh, the changes in, in fluorescent intensity, as well as the thermophoretic changes that were, you know, resulted. And then all of the statistical parameters from that, usually it's, it's like a single, you know, or a couple PDF pages. That's usually a very convenient thing to show to your PI. Um, who is eager for data mm -hmm. when you only did the experiment an hour and a half ago. Yeah, your weekly lab meeting. Yes, yes, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be looking like a <laughs> shining star. Yeah, for sure. Okay, and I assume because it is such an expensive technique, it has to be pretty accurate in terms of reproducibility. Yes. Um, and accuracy. Exactly. Right? And so this, the instrument that we have in our department is automated. Um, most of them are automated where the, the recording of the reading, the analysis, the, the only thing that you have to do is accurately pipette into your 384 well plate, then make sure you don't have any air bubbles when you stick the capillary in the plate and stick it in the yeah. instrument. That is it. Everything outside of that, all the measurements, um, is, is independent of the researcher and is entirely dependent upon uh, the, the system. Uh, so this is a, a technique that uh, in the examples of binding affinities, um, you know, can have dissociation constants from uh, picomolar range to a millimolar range, right? And so that's a huge uh, scale. A lot of instruments can do millimolar, micromolar, and then some nanomolar. But once you start creeping down to low nanomolar range, you, you lose the, the sensitivity. Um, and, and generally the, the use of fluorescence and, and um, the, the way it's combining multiple parameters to, to produce these results allows you to have very sensitive readout um, of that value, as well as you know, the fact that it's automated generally allows a high degree of reproducibility 
that is not seen with some other techniques that are, are, are pretty traditional. Right. I mentioned this in the very first episode with Stravan, uh, where he was talking about high throughput screening. Sure. I mentioned where I remember Dr. Glennon, uh, who is my PI, by the way, and I would love to have him on the show someday. Yeah, that would be a treat. Uh, he, <laughs> that, yeah, that would be the day I will feel, oh, I made it, you know, <laughs> when he is here. So he used to tell me if there is something wrong with an experiment and if there is uh, a human aspect and a machine aspect uh, to that experiment, it's always the human's fault. Yes. <laughs> always. Well, who, who would disagree? You it's know, like always. this is what we hear <laughs> in, a, in the field is that, yeah. you know, if, if there's a human element, then it's human error that results in some of these problems. And that's not yeah. always true, but um, it definitely is your thought process and how you approach resolving these problems that then ultimately becomes your responsibility. Yeah. But yeah. This technique is, it's, it's very easy to, to reproduce data on, on this instrument, provided that the conditions are right. Yeah, and I think like you mentioned, it's not always, sometimes the machine can be wrong. And again, I think this also comes down to calibration, calibrating your instruments right. on time. So that again is like a human error because you didn't do it. Right, this is, this is true. That... So it always comes down to humans. Exactly. <laughs> So uh, I think uh, you mentioned a lot of advantages of this technique. Sure. What are some of the disadvantages? The disadvantages of this technique are consistent with disadvantages on, on any system. Um, for some researchers, they might not have, for example, a small molecule that is very water soluble or is soluble in PBS, uh -huh. um, helps, you know, other buffers, and they have to use a you know, conditions within their buffer to solubilize something that may serve as a disadvantage for not only MST, but other biophysical methods. Um, this, you know, will obviously produce results that are, that are inconsistent with changes you might see on your actual experiment. So your, your buffer conditions for your molecule um, will, will dictate the success using MST and actually in the, the book from a lot of companies they will give you um, a list of different reagents of a buffer and the maximum amount that you can use such that you don't have any of uh, this interference in your experiment. So that is... So these buffers, do you make them or do you buy them? You can purchase some buffers commercially from uh, most of the companies. However, um, given that PIs like to save money and you likely already have these buffers of on course. hand um, for reconstitution, et cetera, uh -huh. you can use your own buffers. Um, they just advise that, you know, because, you know, each, each protein, each, each reagent is, is unique and you may have unique conditions to reconstitute things. They, they give you a generally a, a list of, Hey, these are the maximum amounts that would be um, ideal for, for labeling of your protein or, for the actual experiment itself, which is entirely dependent upon how well the protein is labeled with whatever labeling method you choose. Okay. So most of these conditions can be resolved, but uh, depending upon uh, the reagent you're using, the molecule you're trying to, to work with, it can be challenging to have reliable or consistent results because of some of those other reagents that can contribute to changes that you observe. Uh, in addition, right. in addition, uh, disadvantages are the expense of the consumables. So, you right. know, we have to have uh, basically hide the capillaries and other things because someone who will come in and use the instrument and, and just use all of your, your consumables. And then um, that can be rather oh, wow. expensive for, for a PI to continually replenish the, um, you know, those are all the major limitations of use. I would say that despite the automation, there's generally most instruments have a capacity where it's not a high throughput technique. It can be seen as a, uh -huh. as a, as a moderate or even low moderate um, throughput technique. Uh, it's, it's still faster than, than many other um, biophysical methods, but it, it doesn't have the high throughput capacity that may be desired for um, many you know, researchers or, or, or companies. So it's, it's a smaller set of engagements that you're interested, um, but doing them quickly that that is the efficiency. Right. Yeah. 
Awesome. And I think my last question to you would be, could you suggest any um, articles or protocols like our listeners can go through it? I can link that down in the description for them. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy. Um, you know, obviously, and, and this is going to sound uh, very, very lame, but if you were to Google microscale thermophoresis, you the first handful of results that you get are are going to be uh, the best. So to be perfectly fair, um, the Wikipedia page for what this technique is and how it does uh-huh. is very re- resourceful. It, it is, is pretty accurate okay. and has lots of cut and dry to the point. This is what it is information that would be useful for, for most people. Um, additionally, one of the, the companies that uh, makes this equipment, uh, they're, the company is called Nanotemper. Um, this is the instrument that we have, and this is by no means uh, me you know, selling the product. However, they have a lot of uh, free resources for individuals to better understand what the technique is, how to use it, and then what kind of products are, are required for uh, the use of it. And then, you know, this is, okay. this is something that, you know, I myself have, have published results using this um, experiment, uh, as have many people. Um, but if you were to go in Google Scholar and, and, and evaluate people, you know, choosing to determine binding engagements, chances are they're using MST among a handful of other um, sets of techniques to do so. So mm-hmm. I encourage for the general people that are not aware of MST, what it is and how it really works, go on Wikipedia, go on um, mm-hmm. Nanotemper's page. And, you know, the, the ones that directly come up in Google are the, the, the most ideal for quickly learning about the technique, what it does, how to use it, and then finding out more about the companies that are selling this equipment such that you might be able to convince your PI or your chair of the department or, or someone else that, hey, we need this. We need this in our department. Oh, for sure. Who wouldn't need such an instrument? So with this, I think we are going to end the episode. And thank you, Connor, so much because this was a very informative episode. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me, Barca. I appreciate it. Well, uh, for listeners, uh, please uh, catch me next week for another fun episode. And if you guys have any suggestions about a technique that I should cover, or if you would want to cover a technique with me, please email me at barkha at nerdrxpodcast.com. And remember, it's good to be a nerd. Bye.